Hello, thank you for joining us. So I'm here today with Jacob and Jed. Arca is out this week because he's not feeling well. So we're going to pick up where we left off last time. And let me make the text large here. So we're looking at page 107. And you may recall that we ended off where Socrates had pulled uh, Theodorus back into the conversation. Um, Socrates had taken on the voice of Protagoras, and now Theodorus is playing the role of Protagoras. And Socrates had first defended Protagoras' views, and now he's tearing them down again. So he's going back and forth with all of this. And so just as a reminder here, last time the argument where he ended off was Socrates had said that there's no one who does not think himself wiser than others in some respects and others wiser than himself in other respects. And so he's doubting this idea that we're all, um, truth is whatever it is to me. Um, we don't really think that way. We, we think other people are sometimes wiser than us or sometimes we're wiser than others and we don't necessarily think everything they think is correct. And so we ended here with Socrates saying, and therefore they think that wisdom is true thinking and ignorance is false opinion, do they not? And Theodorus agreed. So this, this part of the discussion goes on for another two pages or so. Um, would either of you be willing to be Socrates? It's a little bit longer than Theodorus's, but either of you willing to read? I can do it. Thank you. And then, Jed, could you be Theodorus? I'd love to. Thank you. Okay, so, um, Jacob, whenever you're ready. Okay. And therefore, they think that wisdom is true thinking ig and ignorance false opinion, do they not? Of course. Well then, Protagoras, what shall we do about the doctrine? Shall we say that the opinions which men have are always true? or sometimes true and sometimes false. For the result of either statement is that their opinions are not always true, but may, may be either true or false. Just think, Theodorus, would any follower of Protagoras or you yourself care to contend that no person thinks that another is ignorant and has false opinions? No, that is incredible, Socrates. And yet this is the predicament to which the doctrine that man is the measure of all things inevitably leads. How so? When you have come to a decision in your own mind about something, and declare your opinion to me, this opinion is, according to his doctrine, true to you. Let us grant that. But may not the rest of us sit in judgment on your decision? Or do we always judge that your opinion is true? Do not myriads of men on each occasion oppose their opinions to yours, believing that your judgment and belief are false? Yes, by Zeus, Socrates, countless myriads in truth, as Homer says. And they give me all, tr all the trouble in the world. Well then, shall we say that in such a case your opinion is true to you, but false to the myriads? That seems to be the inevitable deduction. And what of Protagoras himself, if neither he himself thought, nor people in general think, as indeed they do not, that man is the measure of all things, is it not inevitable that the truth which he wrote is true to no one but if he himself thought it was true and people in general do not agree with him in the first place you know that it is just so much more false than true as the number of those who do not believe it is greater than the number of those who do necessarily if it is to be true or false according to each individual opinion Secondly, it involves this, which is a very pretty result. He concedes about his own opinion, the truth of the opinion of those who disagree with him, and think that his opinion is false, 
since he grants that the opinions of all men are true. Certainly. Then would he not be conceding that his own opinion is false if he grants that the opinion of those who think he is an error is true? Necessarily. But the others do not concede that they are an error, do they? No, they do not. And he, in turn, according to his writings, grants that this opinion also is true. Evidently. Then all men, beginning with Protagoras, will dispute, or rather, he will grant after he once concedes that the opinion of the man who holds the opposite view is true, even Protagoras himself, I, will, I say, will concede that neither a dog nor any casual man is a measure of anything whatsoever that he has not learned. Is not that the case? Yes. Then since the truth of Protagoras is disputed by all, it would be true to nobody, neither to anyone else, nor to him. I think, Socrates, we are running my friend too hard. But, my dear man, I do not see that we are running beyond what is right. More likely, though, he, being older, is wiser than we, and if, for example, he should emerge from the ground, here at our feet, if only as far as the neck, he would prove abundantly that I was making a fool of myself by my talk, in all probability, and you, by agreeing with me, and you, by agreeing with me, sorry, then he would sink down and be off at a run. But we, I must suppose, must defend, or must depend on ourselves, such, such as we are and must ju say just what we think. And so now must we not say that everybody would agree that some men are wiser and some more ignorant than others? Yes, I think at least we must. And do you think his doctrine might stand more, most firmly in the form in which we sketched it when defending Protagoras? That most things, hot, dry, sweet, and everything of that sort, are to each person as they appear to him, and if Protagoras is to concede that there are cases in which one person excels another, he might be willing to say that in matters of health and disease, not every woman or child, or beast for that matter, knows what is wholesome for it, uh, knows what is wholesome for it, and is able to cure itself. But in this point, if in any, one person excels another. Yes, I think that is correct. And likewise... Oh, go, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, sure. And likewise, in affairs of state, the honorable and disgraceful, the just and unjust, the pious and its opposite, are in truth to each state such as it thinks that they are, and as it enacts into law for itself. And in these matters, no citizen and no state is wiser than another, but in making laws that are advantageous to the state, or the reverse, Protagoras again will agree that one counselor is better than another, and the opinion of one state better than that of another as regards the truth, and he would by no means dare to affirm that whatsoever laws a state makes in the belief that they will be advantageous to itself are perfectly sure to prove advantageous. But in the other class of things, I mean just and unjust, pious and impious, they are willing to say with confidence that no one of them possesses by nature an existence of its own. On the contrary, that the common opinion becomes true at the time when it is adopted and remains true as long as it is held. This is substantially the theory of those who do not altogether affirm the doctrine of Protagoras, but Theodorus, 
argument after argument, a greater one after a lesser, is overtaking us. Well, Socrates, we have plenty of leisure, have we not? Apparently we have, and that makes me think, my friend, as I have often done before, how natural it is that those who have spent a long time in the study of philosophy appear ridiculous when they enter the courts of law as speakers. And I want to stop here for a moment because now they're going to change topics. That's a, they're going to go off into a digression. But here we have Socrates's um, objection or latest objection to Protagoras. So I guess first I should ask if we're clear on what the argument is before I ask you what you think of it. I think that it's, uh, it leads to a contradiction. If, you know, every man has the right opinion, then, you know, they would have the right opinion that you were wrong. So there's a contradiction there. And then, yeah. More, more or less similar parts of that. Like he's, he just says about Protagoras that maybe in some respects it is true about things that aren't universal. Like if you eat something and you say it's sweet, then it's hard to say that you're wrong. But in the terms of like piousness or justness, th there's, you know, some something universally accepted about those. There's this section here. Yes. Yeah. Before I say anything, Jed, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I agree with what Jacob is saying. Um, and therefore, we are both right because we both have the same opinion and there's two of us and only one of you. So whatever you think is obviously going to be wrong uh, if you disagree with us. Um, well, what you're saying is two thirds more right than what I'm saying. But isn't he making disagree the... with you? Mm. <laughs> Well, isn't he making the case that um, uh, when it comes down to this opinion, then if it's the opinions that make truth, then we have to go by the greater number, make something right? Yeah, that was this one here. Um, it is just so much more false than true as the number of those who do not believe it is, believe it is greater than the number of those who do. Right. And so then if people disagree with Protagoras or, and give him grief in doing so, um, regular dogs, not dog faced anything, just even regular dogs, um, mm. then he needs to change his opinion, even though he's the teacher. Mm. And I don't think he's going to do that. No, I don't think he will. Um, so that's an interesting argument. Um, and then there's another one um, that comes in at the end where he says, um, uh, there's this, there's this um, thing that people say online a lot. They say, uh, well, you know, I'm a realist. And also different sorts of people say this. And so far, what I've concluded about what a realist is, is it, somebody says they're a realist, they're saying, I agree with all of my own opinions. And because they think it's real, and they're, well, my opinions are real, so I'm a realist. Um, and this is what he's, I think this might be what he's saying here about the laws. In terms of um, uh, what is pious and just, it's based on the laws. Like the city instills. So every city is different, but they're all going to be equally just and pious because that's based on whatever laws you make. Mm -hmm. So, but that also contradicts what he just said a moment ago when he said, well, when we talk about health and, and things like that, is everybody equally knowledgeable about what's healthy and wholesome? Or are there a few that seems to seem to know better? As well, it's a few. Good. Yeah. That's what I'm seeing so far. Yeah, right. And he's saying there's no absolutes. You both mentioned this section here about what is just or unjust, pious or impious. And the view of relativists is that these are not true nature. They don't possess by nature an existence of their own. 
it's all just opinion and that's relativism. So on the contrary, the common opinion becomes true at the time when it's adopted and it remains true as long as it's held. So morality or government's laws, what they decide, what a society decides is good or bad, it's not anything absolute that they're basing truth. Uh, there's no truth that they're basing their morality on. It's just whatever the society thinks at that time and things change. And so morality changes, but they were right when they had a certain law. And if they change their mind, it doesn't mean they were wrong before. It just means that they now have a different notion of truth. It changed. Yeah, my dad would say mm -hmm. it was a different time whenever I questioned him about things mm -hmm. that he would think or do. Yeah, that was a different time. That was a different time. I was equally right then as I am mm -hmm. now. You'll know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so would we say this is democracy? The opinion of the I don't many? think he, he gave any name to it. It's also familiar with um, the coming in and out of style of certain opinions. So it's true for the time. It does mm -hmm. seem to be mm -hmm. how scientific theories work in modern day. Mm -hmm. To some degree, but there is actually, they're testing things and it's just sometimes it's a matter of having better equipment or... I mean, there, there are, I think there's more to science than that. You're right. It's, it's, not, it's not equal because theirs is just simply opinion. doesn't even have to be based on any sort of evidence or equipment, whereas there is some degree of um, I don't know, carefulness usually in scientificness. But, the, but their ideas do come in and out of style. With there's, there's definitely theory. a bias. There's definitely a bias that plays a role in what is allowed to be hypothesized. Yes, certain opinions have to be withheld within the university. Mm -hmm. If you dare suggest that the Greeks were wiser than we are now, don't you understand evolution and progress? How dare you? Well, from this point, um, Socrates is going to go off on a bit of a digression, but we're going to see it's a very important one. He's going to compare the intellectual in the common sense, let's say, like the sophist, to the philosopher. Okay, so this is so. Um, Jacob, do you want to go on as Socrates, or do you want to switch roles with Jed? Sure, that's sure, that's fine. It's fine. Okay, great. Okay, so we ended off here where Socrates says that um, now we have a lot of leisure, um, and he's going to contrast that. Um, that those in who study philosophy appear ridiculous when they enter the courts of law as speakers. And so there's where the contrast comes in. The philosophers like to talk at leisure the way these two men are. But when you enter the courts of law and you're among the, um, let's say, the elites of society, you're not expected to speak at leisure. And so we're right. going to see the contrast from here. That's, I, I did a semester of law, and that's one thing I noticed. Um, they weren't teaching you anything about how to reason or how to get the truth. It was how to use the existing, like, game rules to win. Very, it's very all about winning. For me. <laughs> what do you mean, Socrates? <laughs> Those who have knocked about in courts and the like from their youth up Oh, from their youth up, seem to me, when compared with those who have been brought up in philosophy and similar pursuits, to be as slaves in breeding compared with freemen. In what way is this the case? In this way. The latter always have that which you just spoke of, leisure, and they talk at their leisure in peace, just as we are now talking or taking up argument after argument, already beginning a third. So can they, if, as in our case, the new one pleases them better than that in which they are engaged. And they do not care at all whether their talk is long or short, if only they obtain the truth. But the men of the other sort are always in a hurry, for the water flowing through the water clock urges them on, and the other party in the suit does not permit them to talk about anything they please, but stands over them, exercising the law's compulsion, 
by reading the brief for of uh, the brief <laughs> by reading the brief from which no deviation is allowed this is called the affidavit and their discourse is always about a fellow slave and is addressed to a master who sits there holding some case or other in his hands and the contests never run an indefinite course but are always directed to the point at issue and often the race is for the defendant's life as a result of all this the speakers become tense and shrewd they know how to wheedle their masters with words and gain his favor by acts but in their souls they become small and warped for they have been deprived of growth and straightforwardness and independence by the slavery they have endured from their youth up for this forces them to do crooked acts by putting a great burden of fears and dangers upon their souls while these are still tender and since they cannot bear this burden with uprightness and truth they turn forthwith to deceit and to requiting wrong with wrong so that they become greatly bent and stunted consequently they pass from youth to manhood with no soundness of mind in them but they think they have become clever and wise so much for them theodorus we shall we describe those who belong to our band or shall we let them go and return to the argument in order to avoid abuse of that freedom and a variety of discourse of which we are of which we were speaking just now by all means socrates describe them for i like what you're saying that we who belong to this band are not the servants of our arguments but the arguments are as it were our servants and each of them must wait await our pleasure to be finished for we have neither judge nor as the poets have any spectator set over us to censor and rule us i just want to point out here that socrates did something very clever um, you might recall from the section we read last week that Theodorus said that he's not a philosopher. He gave that up rather quickly and went instead to geometry. However, Socrates has pulled him into the category of philosophers. Let's describe those who belong to our band. So first he described the lawyers or the the elites, and now he's going to describe the philosophers. And he perhaps graciously brought Theodorus in, and Theodorus liked that. You can see, I like your saying that we who belong to this band are not the servants of our arguments. And so that was a very clever way to get Theodorus to agree to speaking at leisure. Nice, nice. Um, and any thoughts of anything that we, we saw there um, before we go on? So now he described again the lawyers. Now he's going to change to describe the philosophers. But before we go on, do either of you have any thoughts or any questions or comments? Um, I liked it. Um, <laughs> it's that feeling of uh, a breath of fresh air that you mentioned last time. Um, sitting there in a, in a lecture theater full of all these people who just seem to be accepting everything that's happening. And I felt like my um, soul was being warped and twisted and think well i'm something wrong with me but he lays exactly what the problems were that i was feeling and mm. sort of didn't have anyone to express it to um so yeah uh, thank you socrates <laughs> um also interesting uh, as a musician he ties it into um uh that like we know that as poets refer to musicians as well for the philosophers um we have uh, spectators who set over us to censor and rule us. Mm. That's an interesting connection. I, I, ne I never saw that connection between the two. And um, oh. yeah, I'm just wondering yeah. about that. The and is here. Yeah. He says, nobody's watching us and trying to speed us along. Like in the courts where they're saying, come on, hurry it up. 
Mm. Yeah, or nobody mm. from the audience yelling out, play Freebird. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want your stupid originals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah, we are um, influenced by those around us. And I, we were talking um, before turning on the recording about um, social media a bit. And yeah, that can influence the way people show themselves. Yeah, so that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, from here, Socrates is going to go on to describe then the philosophers. And so, Jacob, whenever you're very well. That is quite appropriate, since it is your wish. And let us speak of the leaders. For why should anyone talk about the inferior philosophers? The leaders, in the first place, from their youth up, remain ignorant of the way to the Agora, do not even know where the courtroom is, or the Senate House, or any other pro public place of assembly. As for laws and decrees, they neither hear the debates upon them nor see them when they are published. In the strivings of political clubs after public offices and meetings and banquets, and the revelings with co chorus girls, it never occurs to them even in their dreams to indulge in such things. And whether anyone in the city is of high or low birth, or what evil has been inherited by anyone from his ancestors, male or female, are matters to which they pay no more attention than to the number of pints in the sea, as the saying is. And all these things the philosopher does not even know that he does not know, for he does not keep aloof from them for the sake of gaining reputation, but really it is only his body that has its place and home in the city, his mind, considering all these things petty and of no account, disdains them and is born in all directions. As Pindar says, both below the earth and measuring the surface of the earth and above the sky, studying the stars and investigating the universal nature of everything that is, each in its entirety, never lowering itself to anything close at hand. What do you mean by this, Socrates? Sorry, I just want to jump in for a moment here. And um, I'm not seeing, sorry, I'm moving my mouse around and I'm not seeing the cursor anywhere on the screen. Um, but there's this part here where he's talking about investigating the universal nature of everything that is. So here he's telling us what the philosophers think about. And here we go. There's my mouse. Um, investigating the universal nature of everything that is. And um, the Greek there is um, ontos, being, and it's in the plural. So everything, all, net, all the true realities is what they investigate. Okay. Sorry, Theodorus. At the expense of banquets and chorus mm. girls, of all things. Yes. S Giving spending up the chorus girls. Mm. <laughs> spending their Friday nights very differently. Mm. Indeed. Oh, uh, what, do you, what do you mean by this, Socrates? Why, take the case of Thales, Theodorus. While he was studying the stars and looking upwards, he fell into a pit and a neat, witty, Traxian servant girl jeered at him, they say, because he was so eager to know the things in the sky that he could not see what was there before him at his very feet. The same jest applies to all who pass their lives in philosophy, for really such a man pays no attention to his next-door neighbor. He is not only ignorant of what he is doing, but he hardly knows whether he is a human being or some other kind of creature. But what a human being is and what is proper for such a nature to do or bear different from any other. 
This he inquires and exerts himself to find out. Do you understand Theodorus or not? Yes, I do. His neighbor could be a dog-faced bear, as you say. You are right. So again, here, um, Socrates is telling us what kinds of questions philosophers hold. What is a human being? What is proper for the human being to do for that nature? To do and to bear different from any other nature. Those are the questions of the philosophers. Yeah, they say, like, he's, like, looking up, and they mentioned, you know, a universal nature of everything. It's, like, might, you know, be referencing, like, higher realms of reality. Ah, uh, right. This mention of Thales. Um, he was a ancient scientist, a precursor to modern science, and and an astronomer. And so he's looking up at the stars, and he fell into a pit. And so they made fun of him. So from the, the common perspective, there is nothing impressive about the sorts of questions that he wondered about. But of course, to the philosopher, he's someone quite admirable. And so very you know, so contrasting. So I think the two um, ways of relating to the world are very nicely um, symbolized in that story, assuming that it really did happen. All right, definitely. Hence it is, my friend, such a man, both in private, when he meets with individuals, and in public, as I said in the beginning, when he is obliged to speak in court or elsewhere about the things at his feet and before his eyes, is a laughing stock not only to Tracian girls, but to the multitude in general. For he falls into pits and in all sorts of perplexities through inexperience, and his awkwardness is terrible, making him seem a fool. For when it comes to abusing people, he has no personal abuse to offer against anyone, because he knows no evil of any man, never having cared for such things. So... His perplexity makes him appear ridiculous, and as to laudatory speeches and the boastings of others, it becomes manifest that he is laughing at them, not pretending to laugh, but really laughing, and so he is thought to be a fool. When he hears a panergeric, panergeric, Thanks. Panegyric of a despot or a king, he fancies he is listening to the praises of some herdsman, a swineherd, a shepherd, or a netherd, for instance, who gets much milk from his breasts, but he thinks that the ruler... He gets milk from his beasts. From his beasts. Oh my gosh. Yeah, beasts. Excuse me. Uh, but he thinks that the ruler tends and milks a more perverse and treacherous creature than the herdsman, and that he must grow coarse and uncivilized, no less than they, for he has no leisure and lives surrounded by a wall, as the herdsmen live in their mountain pens. And when he hears that someone is amazingly rich, because he owns 10,000 acres of land or more. To him, accustomed as he is to think of the whole earth, this seems very little. And when people sing the praises of lineage and say someone is of noble birth because he can show seven wealthy ancestors, he thinks that such praises betray an altogether dull and narrow vision on the part of those who utter them, because of lack of education, they cannot keep their eyes fixed upon the whole, and are unable to calculate that every man has had countless thousands of ancestors and progenitors, among whom have been in any instance rich and poor, kings and slaves, barbarians and Greeks, 
And when people pride themselves on a list of 25 ancestors and trace their pedigree back to Hercules, or Heracles, sorry, back to Heracles, the son of Amphitryon, the pettiness of their ideas seems absurd to him. He laughs at them because they cannot free their silly minds of vanity by calculating that Amphitryon's 25th ancestor was such as fortune happened to make him, and the 15th for that matter. In all these cases, the philosopher is derided by the common herd, partially because he seems to be contemptuous, partially because he is ignorant of common things and is always in perplexity. Okay, let's pause there. Um, so what do you think of that comparison? What are your thoughts as we're going through this? Yeah, I think the philosopher is, is not like, or I said maybe like regular non-philosophers are more interested in material uh, wealth, let's say, whereas like philosophers are, you know, more con so much more concerned with the meaning of it all that, you know, material desires, which, you know, the mass of people would think are more important, um, you know, don't occur to be important. And so they, they will think the philosopher is, you know, foolish for not, you know, there's many that say like philosophers will live like an aesthetic life with not much material, you know, wealth in them. And, you know, other people, <laughs> non-philosophers would say that's, you know, not winning, I guess. Right. Yeah. Jed, you're smiling. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's not winning or, or you're not getting your money up, bruv, as Andrew Tate would say. Um, I like this because uh, for anybody out there, like in the world, who feels different and weird and awkward because they're not interested in um, their status, they're not interested in their like ancestral lineage, or oh, I'm the son of blah, 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 that's why I go to Yale. And they're not interested in money. And they've been called um, like awkward uh, by girls. Um, consider that you just may be a philosopher mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so and it makes sense. A lot of people, I think, are bec I think a lot of people are disillusioned with those things and they see through it and they feel awkward and they feel like they're kind of mocked for not, not being, for being introverted or not being mm -hmm. attracted to those sort of things. And mm -hmm. maybe they're all like, um, budding philosophers and they have to realize that Socrates has their back and it's normal and maybe you'll be the one who has the last laugh. Hmm. Genuine nice. laugh as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So people who are caught up in that mindset, they truly feel that they are important because of their family lineage or their wealth or social status or whatever. They cannot imagine the state of mind of someone like Socrates or the kind of person Socrates is describing. They not only, it's more than just that they disagree, they can't even imagine that state of mind. And that's what I'm seeing here is that he's describing here are different states of mind. It's not just a disagreement on a point. We tend to think that we look at something external and we either agree or disagree with that. We don't think about the state of mind that is judging. But these are two very different states of mind. And um, that's where it's going from here. We're going to come to, I don't know if we'll get to it today or not, where he gets to talking about the patterns. So he's describing two patterns, two states of mind. And we'll see this continue to develop as we go on. Let me go back to the PDF. Okay, um, let's see how much further we can get here. So Theodorus, I think we ended off with him. 
Right. Well, right. Ignorant of common things and always in perplexity. What a state of mind for someone to be in. Always in perplexity. Fascinating. And all that happens just as you say, Socrates. But when, my friend, he draws a man upwards and the other is willing to rise with him above the level of what wrong have I done you or you me to the investigation of abstract right and wrong to inquire what each of them is and wherein they differ from each other and from all other things or above the level of is a king happy or on the other hand has he great wealth to the investigation of royalty and of human happiness and wretchedness in general to see what the nature of each is and in what way man is naturally fitted to gain the one and escape the other when that man of small and sharp and petty fogging mind is compelled in his turn to give an account of all these things then the tables are turned dizzied by the new experience of hanging at such a height he gazes downward from the air in dismay and perplexity he stammers and becomes ridiculous not in the eyes of tracian girls or other uneducated persons for they have no perception of it but in those of all men who have been brought up as free men not as slaves such is the character of each of the two classes theodorus of the man who has truly been brought up in freedom and leisure whom you call a philosopher who may without censure appear foolish and good for nothing when he is involved in menial services if for instance he does not know how to pack up his bedding much less to put the proper sweetening into a sauce or a fawning speech and of the other who can perform all such services smartly and quickly but does not know how to wear his cloak as a freeman should properly draped still less to acquire the true harmony of speech and him aright the praises of the true life of glo of gods and blessed men i've got to say that is amazingly brilliant that is the the state of mind that he's talking about the negative one um one of the figureheads is this fellow who, whose catchphrase is make your bed and and pull yourselves up from your bootstraps and here he says well a philosopher is not might not know how to make his bed <laughs> it's like a perfect counter to peterson and those those right wingers um brilliant and the other half of um something guys the the breath of fresh air seeing it in print like this the other half of what i found so uncomfortable and um mangling of my soul in in the world and in studying law was they're interested in punishing people all of their debates is you wronged me no 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 i'm going to counter sue and make it you wronged me and so many conversations at school and at home could have been about this the principles what makes something good how can we understand it how can we benefit from it let's spend our time doing that no 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 we're on the clock time is money water clock for them but still the same same catchphrase oh the water's running yeah. out of the water clock isn't their way of saying time is money and they're interested in punishing people and people are attracted to jobs that can have the power to punish or oh, i'm a cop i get to punish you or i'm in my group and you're the bad group you're antifa you're the proud boys well, we're gonna who wronged who and and we can take a step back take a breath take our time now more than ever because we have the technology that we don't really have to work anymore if we're not exploiting each other and say yeah. well what is it like if we stop punishing each other because like he's saying most of us were brought up from children in this way in the state of mind we were never free men right. to begin with and I, right. myself, I can relate to that state of the soul of oh no if i if i step out of line someone can go oh you wronged me or and you deserve x y and z punishment and 
that is terrifying and just add the devil and all like eternal punishment to that mix and it's and it's miserable not only that sometimes you look in the eyes of that person and they see you see delight in them at catching you out of having wronged them and the delight is oh now i get to be the one doing the punishment and not suffering it like i did when i was young and that's sadism and it's terrible and it's inhuman and he put it all there in one paragraph yeah really good points yeah and so that here i've gone back to that section where he's contrasting the specifics of what wrong have I done you or what wrong have you done me to going to what he, and by the way here, um, I don't like the word abstract. He's talking about things in themselves is what he's actually talking about here. It's not abstract. I think the word abstract gives the image of something that is less than real. I um, mean, the common way of thinking is that this physical world is what is real. And as you go up into the world of what they would call thoughts or concepts, you're getting into what is abstract or not real. But um, so if this language maybe fits um, the relativist argument. But I think the translator threw that in here. This is not Socrates. The actual word here is um, self or itself, right itself, or right self. Um, wow. The idea of the specific to the more, the broader way of thinking. What is justice? And actually the word for right is actually justice and injustice is what's used in the Greek. And then talking in general. So rather than talking about a, a particular king, talking about royalty in general, what is truly lofty or noble yeah so that's the contrast between the common way of thinking and as jed was saying the way we're generally raised there was actually one page we passed it up um back on page 119 let me just go back real quick there was a line i didn't highlight but it is actually it fits what jed was talking about um what evil has been inherited by anyone from his ancestors? Jed, how does that fit what you were saying about the way we're raised? Well, yeah. Oh, so when we stop trying to punish each other and, and make the other one wrong as though that wins an argument, whether you're in law school or in the world or in a family, uh, and we can ask this question, and I remember doing it as a youth, like, oh, you, you think you're saying what I did was bad? Yeah. What, what is bad? Steam out the ears. How dare you even suggest we talk about, and who was your teacher? What is justice? Like Socrates is asking, who taught you what justice was? Um, if we can have that argument, then the next thing is, well, let's look at the causes. Instead of running around punishing people, we can ask the causes. What are the causes for us? having wronged or having been wronged instead of and then we can actually address the problem and we won't feel so f fear afraid and 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 anxious and afraid of showing ourselves because we might be looking to the stars we might fall into a hole and everyone's going to laugh at us so to to reach your question here if we do that then we'll ask well, what are the causes for these sort of problems evils that we inherited from our ancestors specifically false ideas about what's right and wrong and how to live whether we should go around hurting each other out of punishment or contemplating our purpose and our nature whether we inherited that from an injustice we suffered as that kid being told to shut up and 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 take your medicine and if that came from our parents maybe they were taught they were slaves as well in this they weren't free men and slaves themselves and then their parents to their parents so there's this evil i don't think in the greek they would use the word evil but there is this injustice or false belief infecting us that we inherited through our ancestors that you could even say is the cause of all of the suffering and injustice we face on the world, both within ourselves in our relationships and how we relate to the human race and the planet. 
which which we could which is actually has a name the the pathologos the sick logos the false belief about these very things we could be addressing that in our leisure time that would be fantastic and necessary yes the true negative that we inherited are these false beliefs about the nature of reality about the way things are and yes, evil has a different connotation for the Greeks because it doesn't have a, um, an inherent reality the way it does in the Christian teachings. So this is, of course, before the, the Bible and that idea was brought in. But um, talking about an injustice or you know something negative or unhealthy, yes. And so that's the true um, negative that we inherit from our families and so yes exactly you said that very well that this is what we need to see through and give up and so yeah coming back here so instead of looking at these specifics we want to look more in general at things in themselves that's what the philosopher looks at uh, Jacob anything to add before we go on uh, may, maybe just that, you know, about the, that talk of pedigree, like if you come from a, a long lineage of, I don't know, no, nobility or something like that, then, you know, you are a slave to that idea that you must, you know, be noble. And, you know, if you aren't, you know, necessarily aware or like proud of your ancestry or anything like that, it doesn't, you know, it does, in a sense, like philosophical sense, free you up to live, you know, however you want to live. You don't have to, you know, have that, you know, continue that, that chain. So that was just something I was thinking on that point. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yes, that people who come from these so-called good families have a reputation to uphold. And it becomes something of a burden on them. It would be harder for them to get into philosophy. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, I would like to try to read maybe another two pages or so. It would be a good point to stop at. So maybe we'll read just a right. little bit more. Okay, right. So um, acquire the true harmony of speech in him, a right in the mm. praises of the true life. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Different kind of music than those that boast and bring themselves up and mm -hmm. talk about material things. If Socrates, you could persuade all men of the truth of what you say, as you do me, there would be more peace and fewer bads injustices among humankind. But it is impossible that evils should be done away with Theodorus. For there must always be something opposed to the good, and they cannot have their place among the gods, but must inevitably hover about mortal nature and this earth. Therefore, we ought to try to escape from earth to the dwelling of the gods as quickly as we can, and to escape is to become like God, so far as this is possible. And to become like God is to become righteous and holy and wise. But indeed, my good friend, it is not all, at all easy to persuade people that the reason generally ad advanced for the pursuit of virtue and the avoidance of vice, excuse me, namely, in order that a man may not seem bad and may seem good, is not the reason why the one should be practiced and the other not that i think it is that i think is merely old wives chatter as the saying is let us give the true reason god is in no god is in no wise and i'm not sure if that's right and in no matter unrighteous but utterly and perfectly righteous and there is nothing so like him as that one of us who in term becomes most nearly perfect in righteousness. It is herein that the true cleverness of a man is found, and also his worthlessness and cowardice. For the knowledge of this is wisdom, 
or true virtue and ig and ignorance of it is folly or manifest wickedness and all the other kinds of seeming cleverness and wisdom are paltry when they appear in public affairs and vulgar in the arts therefore by far the the best thing for the unrighteous man and the man whose words or deeds are impious is not to grant that he is clever through knavery for such men glory in that reproach and think it means that they are not triflers useless burdens upon the earth but such as men should be who are to live safely in a state so we must tell them the truth that just because they do not think they are such as they are they are so all the more truly for they do not know the penalty of unrighteousness which is the thing that they most ought to know for it is not what they think it is scour scourgings and death which they sometimes escape entirely when they have done wrong but a penalty which it is impossible to escape I want to pause there, and we'll get into what that penalty is next time. Um, but what do you think of this part we just looked at? It reminds me, I think of the gorgeous word, or, you know, it's better to receive punishment for wrongdoings than to, you know, get away with it, because, um, you know, your justice will still find you. <laughs> What do you think of that argument? So the basic argument there is that it's better to be wronged than to do wrong. And if right, you right. do wrong, it's better to be punished for it than to get away with it. And so on the surface, it seems like it's the, quite the opposite of the way we generally think. I think it's, it's true to a philosopher's mindset because, you know, they're, you know, if this realm is, you know, constantly changing, um, there has to be some karmic uh, balance, balancing out of these deeds. And it's better to suffer the consequences here and now than, uh, you know, after you graduate uh, from this life. Um, it's one thing you said I'm curious about. You said it's right to the philosopher's mindset. What does that mean? It's right to him who thinks it? So I would say that maybe my idea of the non-philosopher is a materialist or, or caught up in this material realm. So if you weren't punished materially here, then, then you got away with it. But we don't know what happens after. And um, the, these kind of higher level things are more uh you know graspable by by a philosopher hmm. yeah i understand your point um you seem a little hesitant though so are you saying that if a person thinks they're getting away with something they really are so for the, for the time being <laughs> there are these two viewpoints and I think you're doing a good job of capturing the two viewpoints that from the materialist perspective, getting away with stuff is winning. From the philosopher's perspective, it's not. Right. <laughs> exactly. Socrates saying that these two views are both correct for the people who hold them, or is he saying that there's an actual answer to the question? I think he he's indicating that there is an a, a question uh like a truth to it maybe by saying, you know, they don't know about the penalty for their unrighteousness. Um which they they ought to know about it cuz they are going to they are going to know about it. Here. Um right at the bottom of 129. <laughs> Yeah, they do not know the penalty 
of unrighteousness, which is the thing they most ought to know. So it implies that they think they're getting away with something, but they're not. And like, as you pointed out, it's very much like the Gorgias, that same idea is there. Um, so we're going to get into the specifics of how he described that. That'll be, this is sort of a, a little bit of a teaser for next week then. Um, but Jed, bef um, before we go, anything, any thoughts you had about this? Yeah, like what, what you just described, like um, mm -hmm. being clever, what people normally consider wise, and thinking you get away with it. That's capitalism in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. That is. Like if you can exploit your, you know, I don't know. Let's. Oh, I'm not going to dance around it. It's exploitation. If you can exploit your workers to earn more profits or mess with the markets or everyone, what everyone's doing in capitalism, um, and get away with it and be the winner, then that's a huge problem for your soul, according to this. But also the ne the negative side of it. Um, he's saying that people who who don't take part in that can feel like they're useless burdens upon the earth. And, mm -hmm. I, and I've felt that myself, like, oh, I'm not out there, you know, winning the rat race and, and I'm interested more in philosophy and understanding um, the nature of the soul and what's good and where we come from, where we go. I Sometimes I feel like I'm a burden because I'm not doing that, a useless burden upon the earth, that my existence doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah, that's certainly the way that philosophers are viewed by the people who think they're getting away with something here. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes that's yes. And that's important to read this book and to talk mm. with you people here and subscribe to this mm. channel and to, 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 to see that it's not the case. It's just their ignorance and inherited false belief about what's worth doing, both through their ancestry and of the time, like they're saying here, of the time, we're into capitalism. So today, capitalism is good. And getting away with as much as you can exploit is good. And it's not true. It's not eternally true. And the other thing that he said here was that um, real wisdom is the knowledge that God is righteous or just. God is justice oh, and is never not justice. Mm -hmm. And to, to have knowledge of that is true wisdom. Yes. Yeah, so, that's a very, very good line there. Um, back, what page was that on? 29. Let me mark that for us. Okay, that was here. The knowledge of this. Oh, sorry. I did I skip too fast? Like the Theodorus, who skipped too fast from geometry to philosophy. Um, is there something you're going to say about feeling like a burden? No, no, no. Um, just that that is the way that we're viewed, not necessarily the way we see ourselves. That is a false belief if you hold that opinion of yourself that you're buying into. That's maybe one of the um evils that you inherited from your ancestors, if you feel that way about yourself. Usually he uses the word cleverness um, in a negative connotation. Here it seems to be something positive. So that just may be the translator's choice of words. But the true intelligence maybe of a person is found in also his worthlessness and cowardness in that um, nearly perfect righteousness to become so this is to take on the virtues. That person who in turn becomes, let me just highlight this word here, becomes most righteous. That's what he's calling wisdom. So he ties together the idea of wisdom and virtue. And notice also here, he used them synonymously. This is wisdom or true virtue. Right, the true virtue is wisdom. The true virtue of God, and 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 that and that true virtue is linked to knowledge, specifically a knowledge about the way God is perfectly just, perfectly righteous. 
Um, yeah, so God is in no wise and in no manner unrighteous, but utterly and perfectly righteous. And there is nothing so like him as that one of us who in turn becomes most nearly perfect in righteousness or becomes virtuous. And it is herein that the true cleverness of a person is found and also his worthlessness and cowardice. For the knowledge of this, of what it means to be righteous, is wisdom or true virtue. So knowing that it's a state of mind. I think that's what's important to understand about what he means by wisdom. It's a state of mind. It's not about having information. It's about, it's about gaining a state of mind. A state of mind of knowing mm -hmm. the perfect justice of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's amazing. There's justice, mm -hmm. there's knowledge, there's wisdom, and there's God all tied up in that one sentence. Yes, yes. And so what he has given us here, just to wrap it up for today, is two patterns. And this is where we're going to pick it up next time, with these two patterns. Let me get a different color. So these are two states of mind, two patterns, two ways of being. The common idea of um, the good life versus the philosopher's state of mind. And likeness, it, the, mm -hmm. the key word that he used through, mm -hmm. through in a couple of times was mm -hmm. it's through likeness. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, we each have a likeness to the pattern that we follow. Right. So we have these two patterns. And so we're going to go into that next time. That's really where he's going with it. Okay. Is to talk about these two patterns. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, and the pattern, the, the, the good pattern is that of God. God is the true pattern of perfect justice, and it's through likeness to him that we become just in yes, this sentence. To be as like to God is to have true virtue. Wow. It, it really shows the importance of cleaning up my ancestral problem of evil, not just in the way it's used here, but literal evil, because if I don't, then my Irish Catholic idea of God being jealous and smiteful and inventing evil and allowing evil, I don't want to be like that God. We've got to undo those evils and find the true knowledge of the just, true knowledge of justice, number one, and see how that's perfect justice, see how it's in God, and that state of being of that knowledge is wisdom, and put all those together and to develop a likeness to that to develop true virtue for yourself. Yeah, what a page. Nice summary. <laughs> what a summary. What a page. What a page of literature. Amazing. Yes. yes. Amazing. Yeah. And so we'll see even more of that next time. So we'll pick it up there next time. Um, Jacob, any final word? Maybe just that it's, you know, it's impossible that evil should be done away with. So that is that is in here as well. So um, I think that alludes to the fact that, you know, some people would say, you know, maybe they have a hard time believing in God because God allows evil to exist. But this world that we live in, evil, like, exists so that we might have free will. I, I think so. Um, I don't know. That, that's, that's, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's a whole nother discussion, right? That one section right there at the end there about why there must be, must be evil in the world. And uh, so we'll pick it up from there. Oh, wait, wait, on that, on, I, I can't let that one go. I was thinking about that. And I'm so glad that you brought it up. Because this idea of, a just, uh, of addressing the ancient inherited evils that cause us to act unjustly towards each other and to live unjustly, mm -hmm. if, if that is the necessary, if that's, if that's the same evil, if he's picking up that term he mentioned before, then he's saying part of being human is we will necessarily develop these inherited false beliefs about justice and reality. We will inherently, if we're going to be human, you can't do away with the pathologos. So it makes no sense to go around punishing people at all, prisons, 
bad grades. Any of that sort of punishment makes no sense. Laughing at people for falling into holes, for making mistakes. If you understand that having a path of logos is necessary for being human, part of why we're here, then it makes no sense to do that other thing. And what makes a lot of sense is to do the reflection on those, on the causes of that, because perhaps part of why we were born is to address that false belief that we were somehow carrying within our soul. If we, if we keep that idea of uh, necessary uh, ancient evil, then that opens the game. Not, so not only are we not doing what lawyers do, we are opening up a whole new ball game that not only can we understand the cause of, of problems and address them in our world, but we might be figuring out something of why we were born in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, moving. I won't get into the criminal justice side, but philosophically, we're moving from a pattern that's clearly not working for us to one that is much healthier and more and, um, satisfying. And doing that, doing that, addressing the cause of injustice, I wonder if that is part of this good pattern of justice. It's not just a state of being, of knowing justice in the ideal sense of God, but functioning with it in a way that can address the injustices by addressing the ancient evils. Maybe that's part of mm. what's involved. And maybe that's what Socrates is doing here. Yeah, and we'll see a little bit more about what he means by the two patterns then next week. So we'll pick it up there. Yeah, so thank you both. And um, those of you watching this on YouTube, if you do have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those in the comments section. And if you enjoyed this discussion, please hit the like button. It really does help the videos and lets other people know that these discussions are worth being a part of. So thank you very much. See you next time.